Welcome dear friends, uh, as I have said in the previous video on preamble, we will be doing certain topics which is most important in Indian polity. Here I am going to discuss with you part 3 of Indian constitution that is fundamental rights, which is considered to be the most important among all parts of the constitution. Fundamental rights are actually a uniform basket of right that is carried by an Indian citizen throughout the territory of this country. So it is uniform and it is homogeneously available in every part of this country for the meaningful and dignified existence of an Indian citizen. So fundamental rights are very important for any citizen of this country and it is called fundamental right because it is guaranteed by the fundamental law of the land itself and it is a right which is never to be denied to any individual citizen of this country. So from article 12 to article 35 there is fundamental rights. So from article 12 to 35, Indian constitution has embodied certain rights and in fact certain restrictions also that is in part 3 and we will begin with article 12. What is there in article 12? Article 12 is not actually a right per se, rather it is a definition of the state. Now what is the significance of defining state? when we are talking about fundamental right because fundamental rights are not a set of entitlements to the people so you have this right you have that right you are entitled for this you are entitled for that it is not bodied or worded like that rather all the fundamental rights are considered to be a negative obligation on the state in a constitutional democracy that is it is not an entitlement of a citizen rather it is the obligation of the state to make sure that none of the rights which is listed in part 3 of Indian constitution is never made unavailable to an Indian citizen. State shall not deny. This is the common phrase which is used in while describing the fundamental rights. So here the most important thing to make fundamental right meaningful is a clear definition of what we mean by state. So in this part of the constitution, article 12 defines that in this part of the constitution, that is part 3 of the constitution, whenever you are coming across the term state, it happens to mean that state is parliament of India and state legislative assembly of India, government at the center and individual governments in the state and all local and other authorities which comes under the government of India. So you can verify by yourself that here we are not just simply saying that state means the lawmaking body. Rather, everybody who is enjoying the authority of the state, that is an executive, legislative or the judicial authority of the state is considered a state. By giving a very wide interpretation to the term state, we are making sure that the state is not infringing upon the fundamental right of a person through any dimension or any means. So here article 12 has given a very wide interpretation to the concept of state to make sure that never a fundamental right is violated by the state. Next article in this part is article 13 which is again not a right per se but which is added to this part to make this part more meaningful and to make the fundamental rights more deep rooted and available for everybody. Here article 13 has a purpose of making sure that fundamental rights are not violated by the government. First and most important thing addressed by article 13 is what will happen to a law which was prevailing in India either made by the British legislature or made by the Indian government of the country before the commencement of the constitution. If there is any law or any part of a law or a clause of a law which is inconsistent with this part of the constitution that is with the fundamental rights part that is if a clause of a law or a provision of a law which was prevailing in India 
which was enforced in India before the commencement of this constitution and is violative of the fundamental rights principle, then to the extent of that inconsistency with the fundamental right, that law shall be void. So here, as Article 13 sub clause 1, we are making sure that no law which was enforced in India before the commencement of constitution is in a position to violate any of the fundamental rights. Our second concern was addressed through the second sub clause that is what if the forthcoming governments of this country, the next government of this country, constitutional government, if they are infringing upon the fundamental rights of the Indian citizen through a new law made by them. This possibility has been omitted by including sub clause 2 which specifically says that any law which is to be made enacted in this country after the commencement of constitution shall not be violative or shall not be in derogation or inconsistency with the fundamental rights chapter. That means the laws which are to be passed again after this is also not supposed to be violative of the fundamental right. So that possibility is also addressed by sub clause 2. In sub clause 3, we are clearly defining what is a law. Because we don't have, we don't just have a legislative organ as part of the state. Rather we have an executive organ and we have a court that is a judiciary. Through a court order, through an executive order, through any bylaw made by other authorities functioning within the state, through any means or even your religion, through your practices, customs, usages, they can also interfere into the possibility of uh, your fundamental right. That means your fundamental rights can be infringed or taken away by any of these means. So it was the only possible way was to define law in such a way that None of these possibilities can violate your fundamental rights. So the sub clause 3 was designed for that here. We have defined the law, the term law as any law passed by the parliament, any law passed by the state legislative assembly, any executive orders, any practices, customs, usages or natural laws and anything with the force of law in this country. So it was a very wide interpretation given to the law and through any of these means your fundamental rights shall not be violated so you just imagine our constitutional framers were so eager that through any organ of the state or through any means of these organs fundamental rights shall not be violated so article 13 make it more and more deep rooted and meaningful by including everything possible into the ambit of things which are not supposed to be violated by the violating the fundamental rights and there is fourth and last part of article 13 which given which gives an exception to the government's or the parliament's power to amend the constitution because if it is a constitutional amendment if the law which is in question is a constitutional amendment act then that shall not be treated as a law which is mentioned above that is a constitutional amendment can violate fundamental rights so there can be constitutional amendment which is violative of the fundamental right but that considered we will not consider it as an ordinary law just like other laws which we have mentioned above so constitutional amendment acts were omitted but you know uh, as of now there is basic structure doctrine which is having a restrictive impact on absolute utilization of this provision of constitutional amendment because you can't take away or abridge all the fundamental rights at once it is not like that you can have minor amendments and that amendments if it is not violative of the basic structure shall be upheld by the court so this is the fourth part so article 12 which defines what is the state in a very extensive manner and article 13 which talks about laws which was prevalent in the country before the commencement of the constitution laws to be made in the country after the commencement of the constitution and which talks about and define what is a law and which also talks about what happens if there is a constitutional amendment through this article 12 and 13 
our constitution has made our fundamental rights far extensive, deep-rooted and meaningful as possible. Now, we can move on to the actual list of fundamental rights. Do you know what is the difference between fundamental right and human right? Both are rights, but we are giving slightly different definitions for the terms, even though majority of fundamental rights are a part of human rights list also and vice versa but still they they lack uh, or, or they, they are not actually you can't say that both of them are congruent both of them are exactly the same what is the difference is according to the supreme court of india human rights are the basic inherent immutable and inalienable right that an individual is entitled to have by being virtue of born as a human being. At the same time, fundamental rights are the set of rights which is guaranteed by the constitution to the citizen of that country within the limitation of its territory. These limitations of territory, these limitations of citizenship and constitution is not available for human rights. Rather, if you are a human being, that will be available for you. So, fundamental rights is included in the constitution so that you will get certain set of rights if you are in India, if you are an Indian citizen. Sometimes certain rights are mentioned and made available for other citizens or other uh, people from other part of the world also, but that is because it is a part of human rights. That is, there is no mandatory requirement of being a citizen to enjoy human rights. Now, from Article 14, Part 3 of Indian Constitution, Article 14, begins the list of fundamental rights in Indian Constitution. And the first and foremost right among them is equality before law and equal protection of law. That is, the state shall not deny an individual citizen of India equality before law as well as equal protection of law. Here there is a bit of ambiguity for a beginner. That is, what is the difference between equality before law and equal protection of law? Why can't we say that equality before law itself is more than sufficient? And what is the protection part of the law? What is the protective aspect of law? These are the things which is uh, typically asked by the students as doubts. And you know, while classifying this, while teaching this, these two phrases are taken separately. That is, first one is equality before law which is considered as a negative concept of British origin. Whereas equal protection of law is considered as a positive aspect that comes with a positive connotation and along with that it is not a UK concept, it is coming from United States Constitution. Now what is the requirement of incorporating both? If UK Constitution contains only equality before law, and US Constitution contains only equal protection of law, what is the need for India to incorporate both into its constitution? That is another doubt. So there is clear difference between both. First we will address what is equality before law. Equality before law means in this country we are going to treat everybody who are equal with the same law. Imagine the most influential uh, person of this country is committing a crime. He is a corporate, he, he is so rich and he can he is having connection with everybody including the prime minister and he is committing a crime. And a person who is a slum dweller is coming committing the same crime. You can't say that simply because the other person is enjoying a superior status and economic might, he must be treated with a different law. Rather, everybody will be presented before the same law. And regarding equal protection of law, I can give you a condition. Consider certain cases. In the first case, a person 
was carrying he was actually shifting his house from uh, uh, some part to a flat which is on the 17th floor of a huge building and while he was uh, taking he, he was carrying a fridge on his head to the room unfortunately he lost his balance and this fridge fall down from the 17th floor and a person who was the security of the flat was standing below and this fall straight on his head and the person was died and the fridge dropped by you from the 17th floor has killed a person who was standing below the building in the second case another person who was driving a car under the influence of alcohol he was uh, drunk and after a party he was driving his car back home and he hit a person and he killed a person his car hit a person and the person was died in the spot in the third context a person planned and murdered brutally a person for another person for money that is he, he was having certain vengeance and he, he want to get some amount of money from that person for that a person was brutally killed and it was a planned murder and imagine in the three cases the three people has committed the same crime that means all of them has killed another person if it is just equality before law everybody sh shall be brought before the same law and everybody must be given a, a capital punishment or everybody must be given a life imprisonment for murder but you yourself will be knowing that there is no point in giving everybody the same punishment in this context because even though the outcome the result was the same the context was different and the people some of them were in you can't brand them as criminal at all in this context comes the relevance of equal protection of law here as the people have committed the crime on different context we are treating them differently in the first case we will simply consider it as an accident and we will probably ask the person whose ignorance might have resulted or whose from whom this accident has happened to pay a compensation to the family of the deceased person and he will not be penalized uh, for this context and the second case even though you were not having an intention to kill a person ran over a person by riding a car it was your negligence and your purposeful omission of an existing law in this country which was resulted in the death of another person that means even though you were not having a criminal motive to kill another person your ignorance your non compliance of law has resulted in a death so you will be treated on par with a murderer with a different section which will penalize you on culpable homicide where you have done a homicide and which is punishable and you will be punished and you will be treated on par with a murderer just like a murderer you will be treated and in the third context it is a brutal and cold blooded murder it will be treated separately Indian Penal Code will give you a different punishment in this regard and you will be treated as a person who has committed a crime with a criminal motive so both parties alright so here to people who resulted in death of another person the law has given different levels of protection for the first person the law has given all its protection second person was partially protected from branding as a murderer and third case he was branded as a murderer please understand treating unequals equally amounts to inequality in this case all the three were unequals so if you are applying the very principle of equality before law in the three contexts alike then you are doing an injustice what you are perpetuating is an inequality so for this for this very purpose with this example I think you you might have been it might have been clear for you what is the difference between both these phrases for any polity to be just for any state to be just, any constitution to be just and fair, 
we need both this concept that's why in article 14 of indian constitution our constitutional drafters has included both equality before law and equal protection of law so we will be discussing uh, the other articles of this part in the future sessions today we will stop with article 14 thank you